God bless you tonight. Let's go to the Gospel of St. Matthew, and we are going to read from chapter 16 and verses 21 through 23. Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 23. Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 23. The Bible says from that time forth, Jesus began to show on his disciples how that he first must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and raised again on the third day. Verse 22, Then Peter took him, began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Peter was saying, Lord, uh-uh, you're not going to suffer. You're not going to be killed, and you're not going to die. But look what the Lord said. The Lord turned. And said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. I started to title this message, Are You a Satan? Are You a Satan? But I said, no, I'm not going to do that because nobody's going to understand what I'm going to be talking about if I leave that title that way. And so I have titled it, The Adversary. The adversary. Amen. Let's pray over the word tonight. Lord Jesus, I love you and I praise you. I love you and I exalt you. I love you and I magnify you. I thank you, Lord, for your sweet spirit that I feel in this house tonight. God, I ask you to allow your word to go forth and penetrate and touch hearts and minds and minister and strengthen and bless in the mighty name of Jesus. And somebody say, amen. amen. You may be seated. Simon Peter, before his conversion, and even after his conversion, he was a very unique man. Simon Peter was bold. Simon Peter was stubborn. Simon Peter was obnoxious. Simon Peter was impulsive. At times, Simon Peter had anger issues, and at times, his language was very coarse. But even though with these faults and these failures of Simon Peter, these sins of Simon Peter, Simon Peter, even before his conversion, had an unshakable faith in his God. He had a zeal, and he had a passion for his God. And because of his zeal, because of his passion, and I also believe because of his honesty and sincerity of heart, even with all the things that I just mentioned, Simon Peter was given something that none of the other apostles received. Simon Peter, the Bible says in chapter 16, beginning with verse number 13, when Jesus came Unto the coast of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? Verse number 14, the Bible says, And they said, there was not any agreement. Some say thou art John the Baptist. Some say Elias. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're one of the prophets. Then Jesus had to look at them and ask this question. He saith unto them, but whom 
say ye that I am. And 16 says, and Simon, not John, not Matthew, not Mark, but Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because of that testimony, because of that unshakable faith in God, the Lord said in verse number 17, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which he is in heaven. I am glad to know that people that want to know who Jesus is, God will reveal himself. God will show himself, and God will manifest himself. But not only did the Lord bless him because of the word of his testimony, but he also, in verse number 19, or verse number 18, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now the Lord was not saying to Peter, upon you am I going to build my church, but upon the profession of faith that you know who I am, that I am Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, that I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So he gave Peter a revelation that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ was going to be built upon Jesus Christ. And even though the gates of hell would try to fight, even though there would be times of battle, even though there would be times, amen, in the heat of things, hell would not gain the victory. And then verse number 19 gives us revelation. And I will give unto thee. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He didn't give them to any of the other apostles. He gave them to Simon Peter. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Right. Peter, because of his profession of faith, his unshakable faith, the revelation of understanding who Jesus Christ was, he came into possession, the power of access for the kingdom of God. What, what are keys? Keys are the power to gain access to a house. You have the key, you unlock the door. You have the key, you lock the door. You keep that which is inside safe by the key, and you protect, amen, those that are inside from the outside by the key. And if you want to get into that house, you use the key. So Peter had a key to the kingdom of heaven that whatever he bound on earth would be bound in heaven. Whatever he would loose on earth would be loosed in heaven. And because of this, he was the instrument of opening the door of faith to preach the gospel, first of all, to the Jews in Acts chapter number 2. He was there to preach, amen, the word of God to the Gentiles in Acts chapter number 10. Even though Philip went to Samaria and preached to them to believe on Jesus, to be baptized in Jesus' name, Peter came down with John, amen, and prayed that God would give them the gift of the Holy Ghost to impart that power, to impart that anointing. And so Peter had the power of access. He was the first to preach the gospel. He had the authority to teach the truths of the kingdom. So Jesus Christ was trusting with him to say the right words, to preach the right words, because whatever he was going to declare, whatever he was going to preach, was going to be the word that heaven was going to stand by. So he would preach the truths of the kingdom, the doctrine of salvation. He would preach the full declaration of, of the way in which God was going to save sinners, that God was going to bring Jew and Gentile together in the new body that was going to be called the church of the living God, the family of the living God, the tabernacle of God. Amen. It was through and by Peter. And because Peter had the keys, there was associated with that a great prestige. There was associated that with great honor. But Peter also 
knew something about Jesus beside the revelation that thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And we find this in John chapter 6, verses 66 through 68. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. We know that 5,000 left him. And who these other disciples were, we do not know. But we do know that there was only 12 left. Because the Lord said unto the 12, Will you also go away? Will you also go away? And then look what verse 68 said. Then Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. So not only did he know that Jesus was God manifest in the flesh, but he also knew, amen, that Jesus had the words of eternal life. And if we are going to be saved, if we are going to make heaven our home, amen, we've got to understand that Jesus and he alone has the words of eternal life. So Peter had an unshakable faith. Even with his faults, even with his failures, even with his shortcomings, he could have walked with a cocky attitude and say, well, look at me. Look at the words that I have revealed. Look at the promise and the blessing that Jesus has given to me. But I want you to notice something, and I don't know if you've ever noticed it before. I, I did not know until the latter part of last week I knew it, but I, I didn't know it, if that makes sense. After Jesus declared that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, in Matthew chapter 6, 18, amen, and declared, and the Lord gave him the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus told Peter something else just two verses later. He turned. And said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now, how can it be just three verses before, four verses before, he said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon him, his testimony, amen, the word of Jesus Christ, the church was going to be built. He would have the keys to unlock and to bind. And now Jesus turns around and calls him Satan. The man that had the keys to the kingdom, the man that had the great revelation of who God was, now the Lord has called him Satan. Now, I want us to go back to verse number 21 of Matthew chapter 16. The Bible says, From that time forth, speaking after he gave the keys to Peter, in verse number 19, from that time forth, in verse 21, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. It's not going to happen. You're not going to die. You're not going to be killed. You're not going to suffer many things. And he rebuked him. The man that had the keys to the kingdom, the man that just great, gave great revelation, said, ah, you don't know what you're talking about. You're wrong. You're wrong, Jesus. And when he made that statement, he said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Right. What, what does that tell me? That tells me we could speak the word of God in faith, we can have revelation of the Word of God. But then, not too long after, we can become a Satan. Before anybody starts rising up, ready to throw bricks at me. Satan was not the devil's name. The devil's name was 
Lucifer. Satan, if you will pull out your Strong's Concordance, the word Satan simply means an adversary or an accuser. An adversary or an accuser. So the Lord was not telling Peter, you're Lucifer. He wasn't telling him, you're Lucifer. He wasn't calling him the son of Lucifer. But what he was saying, because Lucifer is an accuser of the brethren, because Lucifer, if you will, was an adversary to the kingdom of God, Peter, because of his testimony, Peter, because of his words, took on those attributes that resided in Lucifer. The Bible declares this. Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For you savors not the things, verse 23, that be of God, but those things that are of men. What the Lord said, you're, you're, you're in my way. Peter, you're in my way. You're an offense and you're a hindrance and you're, you're going to become a snare to me because you savorest not the things that be of God. What you are doing is you are minding and you are partaking, not of the nature of God, not of the will of God, not of the kingdom of God, but you are taking part of the nature of man. Because your viewpoints that you're not going, that you rebuke me with, that you are not going to suffer, you are not going to die, you are not going to be handed over, that is the viewpoint of man. And that is not the viewpoint of God. It is not the way of God. So what Peter faced here in Matthew 16, and the words that he spoke a few verses before, and the words that Jesus spoke to him can be applicable to you and I. Because the ways of God and the ways of flesh are always contrary one to another in their operation. So it is possible, and we'll put it in terminology that we can understand. We can have a shout down on Sunday or Wednesday, talk in tongues and rejoice and praise God and magnify God and feel the power of the Spirit and be blessed of God. But we can walk out of this building or maybe not even walk out of the building, but then we begin to speak the ways of men that are not in alignment with the ways of God. Amen. We begin to take on the attributes, once again, a man's thinking, instead of keeping God upon our mind and God upon our heart. And that, that when we do that, we become an adversary to the things of God, to the will of God, to the plan of God. Because the words that we speak hold weight. The words that we speak will either bring life or death. And so we need to make sure as children of God, we are speaking the things of God. We are speaking the word of God. We are speaking the plan of God and not being filled with man's viewpoints. Amen. Because if we do that, amen, the ways of flesh are going to begin to take control and they are going to be contrary to the ways of the Spirit and the ways of God. God's will, God's plan was that Jesus would go to Jerusalem. He would suffer many things at the hand of man. He would be crucified. He would die. He would be buried. But he would rise again on the third day. But Peter said, no. No, we're not going to have any of that. Why? Galatians 5, 17, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. The desires of the flesh, they are opposed to the Holy Ghost. The desires of the flesh are, are opposed, amen, to the desires of the spirit. They are 
against each other. We're standing each other constantly, fighting each other constantly so that you are not free and you cannot do the things that you would desire to do. We need to make sure that we crave those things of God and not begin to crave and not fall into the trap of the things of the flesh. Amen. Why? Because the things of the flesh, that is part of our old life. That is part of our old nature. That is part of our carnal thinking that should have been buried and stay buried. Amen. Under the waters of baptism and under the blood of Jesus Christ. But because we don't keep it a lot of times in check, that old man rises up and that old man begins to speak against the things that God wants to do. Maybe, maybe not on purpose, but because we lean to the flesh erroneously as Peter did. I think when Peter said those words that this is not going to happen, I think he was sincere and honest. I really believe he was sincere and honest because he did not want to see that happen. He did not want to see that happen. But what happens is the adversary works through the channels of our fleshly desires and our weakness. You need to understand something about Lucifer or the devil, Satan. He is not powerful enough when you're filled with the Holy Ghost for him to come up to you and take control of your life. Can't do it. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Satan has no power. Satan has no authority over you. So if you're prayed up, if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, he cannot overtake you. He cannot overpower you. But what he does, he waits until you're weak. He waits until... You're distracted. He waits, amen, uh, until the fleshly desire is building up with inside of you, whatever it may be, and then he will pounce on that. He will pounce on that. And when he pounces on that, because we are weak spiritually for whatever reason, we are distracted for whatever reason, we may begin to say something. We may begin to talk about something that is not of the spirit, but it is of the flesh. So he works through our fleshly desires and our weaknesses. This is how he gains control. So the moment that we stop walking in the Spirit, listen, the moment that we stop walking in the Spirit, we, are allow, we allow ourselves to become vulnerable. Mark chapter 8 and verse number 33 basically says the same thing. When he turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, Get behind me, me, me Satan, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. So what was Simon Peter's problem? Why did he say, you're not going to suffer? We're not going to allow this to happen. Could it be? Could it be this? In Luke chapter number 19 and verse number 11. Now, as they were listening to these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was approaching Jerusalem. And because they thought the kingdom of God was going to be brought to light and showed forth immediately. What people were thinking, they weren't seeing the kingdom of God as a spiritual kingdom. But they were looking at it as a physical kingdom. That Jesus was going to set up shop. Jesus was going to establish his throne right there, right then. And break the Roman curse, break the Roman authority. And once again, restore Israel to the glory days with Jesus Christ being King of kings and Lord of lords. And so I believe the reason why, and I could be wrong, but I believe the reason why that Jesus was told by Peter, you are not going to suffer these things. You are not going to die on a cross. You, you are not going to be made ashamed of because this was in his mind that we're going to have the kingdom of God and it's going to bring victory. It's going to bring liberty. It's going to bring anointing. It's going to bring dominion and power. And it's going to break the Roman rule that we are under. Now, Peter's thought process was just a, a natural 
thing that they were wanting because they did not understand. They did not have the revelation that the kingdom of God was not going to be physical at this time, but it was going to be spiritual. And Jesus told them in John chapter 18 and verse number 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So he had to flat out tell him, my kingdom is not of this world. If the kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews? But now is my kingdom not from hence. So Jesus had to tell him, look, we're not talking about a physical kingdom. We're talking about a spiritual kingdom. And because Peter was looking at it through the eyes of flesh, he became an adversary. He became a hindrance he would become an obstacle to the plan, to the work of God. We, as we walk with God, as we face each day, we need to make sure that we do not put ourselves in the place that we become a hindrance to the moving of the Spirit of God. We don't become a hindrance to the flowing of the Spirit of God because our flesh is seeing one thing and that's what we're going to naturally gravitate to because we're human. But we've got to crucify that. We've got to deny ourselves those thoughts that I am going to keep my mind. I am going to keep my will. I am going to keep my purpose and my plan upon what God is going to do because my God is faithful. My God is true. That's how great my God is. That's how awesome my God is. That's how mighty my God is. I don't want to stand in the worry. So, I don't want to stand as as an obstacle. The adversary has access into our lives through the door of uncrucified flesh. The Apostle Paul said this, and I I just think it's so amazing that he said it. And there there was a period of time, 1 Corinthians 9.27, that this was sticking with me so much several years ago. But Paul said, but I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. Lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I could preach a sermon and I could be lost. So I've got to keep my body under subjection. And what Peter did in Matthew 16, calling Jesus Christ the Son of the living God, he was preaching a sermon in effect. Saying in John chapter 6, you have the words of eternal life in effect. But his body... His flesh, amen, was not under control. It was not in subjection to the Spirit because when Jesus brought the revelation that I am going to suffer, I am going to die, Peter said, ah, no, 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 no. His intentions were good. The meaning was good, but it was not the plan of God. And and Paul understood this, that I've got to keep under my body. I've got to bring it under subjection. That even after I had preached the gospel, I myself should be a castaway. And of course, Galatians 5, 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. It is not just a one-time happening, but but it is a, a daily process. I am crucifying this flesh because I don't want this flesh to take control. I don't want this flesh, amen, to begin to speak words of doubt or words of fear or words of misunderstanding that would become a hindrance to the cause of the kingdom of God. And we need to realize that one thing we need to be constantly aware of, that Satan, if you will, amen, Lucifer, if you will, the adversary does not give up after a momentary defeat. You mark it down, he will come back. We see this in Luke chapter 11, verses 24 through 25, when a demon is cast out of a person. And I know this is speaking about a demonic individual, but let's, let, let's look at it, amen, also in this vein and in this way, that when someone is filled with the Holy Ghost, amen, God has took residence in there. The devil's been cast out of you. They may not have been demon-possessed. But it goes to wander in the waterless realm, searching for rest. And finding none, he said, I will return unto my house once I came out. And the Bible says, when it 
returns in verse number 25. When it returns and he cometh, he findeth the house swept and garnished. He findeth it swept and garnished. What happened? The house has become holy. The house has become cleansed. But the house is empty. The house is empty. What, what has happened? Amen. The individual has not stayed full of the Holy Ghost. The individual has not filled his heart and his mind with the Word of God. Amen. To meditate and, and to dwell upon the richness of the Word of God. So we want to live a life of victory, then we have to constantly submit ourselves to the will of God. We have to keep our flesh crucified on a continual basis because if not, we will begin to grow weary. We will begin to become weak. Oh, we may be holy. We may have good intentions. But when that spirit comes back around after it has been defeated once, he's going to try to come back around with another temptation, with another trial, with another test. And when we are empty, when we are weary, it is very possible that we will fall. We have to keep our flesh crucified. Look what Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 14. He said, brethren, we are not debtors to the flesh. We are not debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. What on earth does that mean? It simply means that we are not obligated to our carnal nature anymore because we have been saved. We have been born again. So if you live, verse 13, after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify, you kill the deeds of the body, the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. So if you live according to the dictates and desires of the flesh, you'll die. But if you through the power of the Holy Ghost are habitually putting to death those fleshly desires, amen, those things that are prompted by the body, you will live forever. And you will not be an adversary. You will not be a Satan to the work and to the kingdom of God. Verse number 14, for all, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So the flesh has no claims on us when we are born again. We are not debtors to the flesh. And we have no further obligation to live in obedience to the flesh. Because now, as Romans chapter 6 says, we have been delivered. Amen. We have been set free by that truth that we have believed. And we are not going to yield our members as instruments of unrighteousness, but we are going to yield our members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So our debt is not to the flesh. Because what did your flesh ever do for you? Right. Gets us in trouble. That's why Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, Romans 12, 1, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. He said, I'm encouraging you to surrender yourselves to be God's sacred living sacrifices. Because this is what you should do. Now, I, I want you to notice something. We know that Jesus was going to be betrayed by Simon Peter, do we not? We know that Jesus was going to be betrayed by Simon Peter. And Simon Peter denied the Lord three times. And I think it's very interesting that the Lord did not call him Satan then. The Lord did not call him Satan when he did not Lord. Only when he spoke the will of the flesh, which was in opposition to the will of the Spirit. Now, we might say denying the Lord is actually a lot worse than just saying, you're not going to die. We're not going to let this happen. We're, we're going to 
stand strong. And I, I don't know if this is going to make sense or not. When someone denies the Lord, yes, that is destructive. Yes, that is dangerous territory. But if I deny the Lord, that's not going to hinder the kingdom of God. It's going to hinder me. But if I speak out of turn, that is in direct opposition to the will of God and the plan of God, then I become an adversary to what God wants to do. And when I accuse my brothers or I accuse my sisters as Satan does, you're no good, you're a backslider, you'll never get right with God, you can't be used of God, you become a hindrance, I become a hindrance. Because we're holding back. We're holding back what God wants to do. Because God can take anybody and use anybody for his kingdom and his glory. I don't want to be in opposition to God. I, I don't want to be a Satan, if you will, that I become an adversary to the kingdom of of God. I don't want to speak my mind. I don't want to speak my heart. I don't want to speak my will. But I want to speak the will of God. I want to speak the promises of God. And let, let me give you an example of maybe what I'm talking about. When I pray, not every time, but the majority of times when I pray, and I, I did it tonight when we had our church corporate prayer, praying for the sick, I said, Lord, I thank you for the backsliders that are coming home. I thank you, Lord, for the new people that are born again. Well, we can look around and say, where's it at? It hadn't happened. I'm speaking the will of God because that's been promised to us. But if I begin to say that, well, that's, that's really not going to happen, you know, then I'm speaking in opposition to what God wants to do and what God has promised to do. So I don't want to be like Peter in that sense. I want to have the faith. I want to have the raw faith that he had. I want to have the unshakable faith that he had. I want to have the revelation that he had. But as I do that, I've got to make sure in my heart and in my life that I am not becoming an adversary to the kingdom of God. Once again, Peter was well-meaning. I, I firmly believe that. But sometimes when we're well-meaning, we could be way off course. We could be way off course. When a pilot is flying a plane, there are times that the visual landmarks that they use to guide them because of storms, darkness of night they cannot see and so they have to rely upon those instruments and, and I have read that there are times that when a pilot is flying a plane and they may be flying in clouds as an example their perception may be that they're flying level but actually, they could possibly be upside down and not even know it. They think they may be flying level, but may be actually going down because they, they can't see. They can't see the surround. So what they have to do is they have to look at the instruments. They have to trust the instruments. They've got to look at 
uh, the altimeter to see how they're flying. And, and, and look at the instrument. I, I don't know what it's called that shows the wings of the plane and if it's balanced or not, but just about every cockpit has one. They've got to trust those instruments, even though they cannot see it with the natural eye. We as children of God, there are times that we are not going to be able to see and we are not going to be able to perceive. And our natural eye may tell us everything's okay, or on the other hand, our natural eye can tell us everything is not okay. But because we cannot see, we've got to trust the Word. We've got to trust His Word. We've got to depend upon His Word. And we will come out on the other side of winter. That's why Peter could preach on the day of Pentecost. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's why he, in Acts chapter 10, could preach repentance, and Cornelius and his household received the Holy Ghost, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord because he had the keys of the kingdom of heaven, because he had an unshakable faith that even though he messed up, he knew how to get it corrected. He knew how to get it straight. He knew that he had an awesome God and a loving God and a marvelous God. And we have the same today. And we need to shout. We need to rejoice. And we need to praise our God. That we don't have to remain an adversary to Jesus we don't have to remain a Satan, if you will, to the name of Jesus. Because remember, Satan means just adversary and an accuser. I want to love God. I, I want to serve God. I want to make sure the steps that I walk are ordered by the Lord. And I believe as we stand, every step that we take, no matter how small or no matter how great, let it be directed by God so we don't fall. Let every step that we take, whether small or great, be ordered by God so we don't hinder the kingdom of God. Right now, I am weighing in my mind a, a situation. Which way I'm gonna, which way I'm gonna go, what I'm gonna do. Now, I was talking to my wife about it today because I got a few days to make up my mind, and she said, "Think about it real hard. Think about it real hard. One way would ease a lot of pressure." But I've got to ask myself, is that what God wants right now? I don't want to become an adversary. I want to follow him. I want to love him. And I want to deal wholly with him. Because I know my God will see us through. And everybody say amen. Let's lift our hands. Let's love the Lord as Sister Kick Lighter sings. <laughs>